No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Okay. So uh, what's the ability thing that Jesus talks about there in John 6, 44? We do not have the ability apart from the call. Okay. Use, use verse 44 words. Okay. Um, unless the Father draws you. Okay, so draws. So the Father's drawing. Um, and then on our end, can. Okay. So that's, that's the ability part. And what can, what do we have the ability, who has the ability to come to the Father, according to Jesus in verse 44? No one. No one, no one. yeah. So the gospel goes out, and who has the ability to receive it? No one. No one. Okay. Are we going to argue with Jesus on that? No. No. Uh, but why does anybody believe, then, according to Jesus? The Father draws them. The Father draws them. Okay, now Jesus is in the middle of this great conflict, chapter 6. Um, he'd been in a great conflict in chapter 5, too. He's arguing, arguing with the Jews, and he's telling them why they don't believe and why they're arguing with him. And at the same time, he's explaining to his disciples why these people are arguing with him, even though he's just fed 5,000 people with bread. And they're arguing with him. Does that make any sense? No, it makes no sense. And so Jesus says this to them. They don't have ears to understand what he's hearing. But he's explaining to them why they don't believe. It's because they cannot. Because another person of the Trinity hasn't done something. What's that? No, use verse 44. The Father hasn't drawn them. Now, it's also true. The Spirit, and we'll talk about that a bunch in the, the uh, gospel lesson this morning, that the Spirit is, is uh, the person of the Trinity who enables. And the Spirit is sent out uh, by the Father and the Son, uh, both, John 15, 26. And uh, the Spirit of God gives life. Um, just like uh, God breathed life into Adam um, in physical terms and spiritual terms there with Adam. Uh, but then people are born from that point, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, born physically alive, but spiritually what? Dead. dead. And so Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1, and you were dead in your transgressions and sins. He doesn't mean they were physically dead, but he's not lying either. And so how do we understand when Paul says you were dead? We were dead in what way? Spiritually, Spiritually dead. Uh, and, and so just as a physically dead person can't run a marathon, a spiritually dead person can't respond to the gospel. There's no ability on either of those fronts. And so you need physical life to run a marathon. You need uh, spiritual life to hear and, and see and, and believe the gospel. Okay, and so that's what effectual calling is about. How does anybody believe? How does someone believe? That's a, that's effectual calling, and, and it's because God acts upon them. Yeah, Steve. So the drawing, mm -hmm. uh, does the drawing come before salvation? In other words, yes. Are they being made? They're drawing. They're drawing toward. God's drawing them towards their conversion. That's right. Yeah. So regeneration precedes faith not the other way around because faith can't happen we can't but in the drawing in other words yeah. are they not fully regenerated when they're being drawn in other words i'm curious I'm yeah so we're what you're uh, um so theologically what we're speaking of is effectual calling is speaking of the moment of salvation but it's also appropriate to talk about steve which is what you're getting at that god can be putting events in our lives to cause us to think differently Planting seeds. Planting seeds, yeah. And so when someone comes to faith, it's often often the case that they say, you know, so-and-so said this to me 12 years ago or three years ago, and it always just kind of stuck with me. But, but three years ago or 12 years ago, that wasn't an effectual calling. But God was in the process in his sovereignty of bringing someone to, to himself. And so, but with effectual calling, we're just talking about that little 
that final push over the goal line. Um, what enables someone to believe to, to come from having something kind of stick with them, which doesn't require uh, spiritual life. You know, you can be bothered without spiritual life. You know, non-believers feel guilty. Um, their conscience is bothering them. But, but what causes them to say, and I agree with what I heard 12 years ago, that's effectual calling. The Spirit has worked, and you cross that point. You cross over from death to life, is what Jesus says in John 5. Uh, and, and you've been given life, and then you believe. Yeah, Bill? But it's kind of like the Apostle Paul. He always thought that he was seeking God for yeah. all those years. Yeah, yeah. He was raised in the scriptures. Yeah. He thought he knew everything that yeah. was going on. Yeah. He thought he was seeking God. Yeah. But he wasn't. Yeah. He was following his own path of righteousness. Yeah. And God, without Paul asking for it, yeah. knocked him off his horse. <laughs> And blinded him mm -hmm. and said, I've got plans for you. Mm -hmm. he, he didn't say, do you want to come to this altar call? Do you want to, mm -hmm. you know, anything like that? God yeah. just did it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Anyone like that, Bill? I think he was, I, I know Bill. <laughs> Bill and I, I, you have a similar story. And, yeah. you know, Bill thought, of course I'm saved. I'm pursuing God and all that kind of thing. And then he realizes, what's that? I was raised in it. Yeah. Through all these altar calls. Yeah. Verses of just as I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, good. So that's that's effectual calling. Uh, God's work upon us um, to, to bring us, to enable us um, to embrace uh, Jesus Christ. Um, so enable was that word I was looking for, which is up here, but, uh, but it's just can. The simpler word is there in our, our Bibles there. Okay. Good. So um, let's let's turn back to um, uh, Revelation twenty. Sorry for quizzing you on something that wasn't there. <laughs> stuff mm -hmm. i felt kind of like uh, about having calls to faith altar calls whatever yeah because i feel like the danger is emotional or social pressure uh-huh that will cause someone to possibly damage their soul by lying to themselves and everyone else mm -hmm. um, but is there any good in those things yeah yeah because because we do ask um you know we ultimately that the gospel sharing is put into our put into our hands mm -hmm. and so we ask someone to um to believe and we call someone to believe knowing that just like jesus did think parable of the soils we'll read that this morning in our, our gospel reading that the gospel seed goes out to everybody but there are four kinds of responses to it right what are the four kinds of where the four places this the gospel lands on there's the hard path. That's the person who says what? Nah. Nah, they don't even consider it. They just say, no, nope, not for me. I don't do religion. Okay, and then uh, what are the kind of middle kind of uh, landing zones? Rocky and the weeds. The rocky soil and the soil with weeds. The rocky soil, the seed, uh, uh, um, you know, kind of gets in the soil. There's a little bit of soil, and it looks like, there's saving faith there for a little bit, but what happens? Yeah, persecution is the rocky soil. And so there's not, not any depth, and so it just, it just dries out without producing any fruit. Now, what do you need to produce fruit? Spirit of God. And so there's no regeneration there. See how that works? And so that's somebody who comes into the church and even starts getting involved in the church, but there's no faith there and so that person when persecution comes they say i'm out of here this is tough because they haven't seen the gospel they don't know its value they haven't sold everything they had and bought the field right because there's the treasure in the field that you say this is this is uh, worth it um there's the uh, other kind of soil that you mentioned too besides rocky in the middle there thorny, thorny. thorny soil and what's that one not persecution yeah, but 
cares of the world. Yeah. So, you know, I've got soccer practice or, or whatever, you know, I've got, you know, I've got to work. And, and so somebody, you know, says, you know, I could, I have a store, I could make more money opening, opening up, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon. So I'm just going to work instead of going to, to worship. And then pretty soon they're not in the church anymore. Cares of the world. I mean, it can be all kinds of different things. And then fourth kind of soil. Good soil. Yeah. Good soil. And what happens there? Bears fruit. Yeah, bears fruit, 30, 60, 100 fold. Okay, so that's where fruit is born. Fruit of the Spirit. So the Spirit is present. There was regeneration, new life, spiritual life by the Spirit. Effectual calling happened. And because the Spirit of God is there, there's an endurance until the end. That's a fruitfulness. There, and there's a fruitfulness um, in life um, prior, to, prior to seeing Jesus face to face. Um, last, last week we talked about um, Old Testament prophecy and um, what we understand from it. Uh, and think about Jonah. What's Jonah's prophecy? What's his message to the Ninevites? You will be destroyed in 40 days. You will be destroyed in 40 days. Um, is, that a, is that a promise of a guaranteed promise of a certain future? Is that how we take prophecy? No, it's not a guaranteed promise of a certain future. What What is it? It's yeah, it's a warning of a, what kind of future? Potential. Potential future. That's, how, that's what prophecy is about. When you look at scripture and you see what God is doing, he's, he's driving people, he's seeking not to prognosticate, but to motivate. Okay, not to predict and just let people know what's happening beforehand. Um, so that they can show off to their friends and then say, I told you so when it happens. Uh, but what God is doing in prophecy is he's, he's, uh, he's motivating um, his people, or in the case of Jonah, the Ninevites, not his people. He's, he's motivating them uh, to faithful action, to repentance and faith. Um, Okay, so that's, that's what uh, prophecy is about. Um, when you're looking at Old Testament prophets, um, you can um, uh, see things. Who, and who are they talking? Who is that message for? When we read an Old Testament prophet, one of the prophets in the Old Testament, who is that message for? To people it's delivered to. Yeah, it was to the people that were living during the prophet's time. That's why it was given then and not today. Um, but... Can we benefit from messages that were given to other people? Yes. Yeah. Um, just like the Gospel of Matthew was not written to us. Now, we can, um, otherwise, it'd be written today. All right? Okay. But can we benefit from this Gospel written to other people? Yes. Yeah. So, so what we're doing uh, when we read all of Scripture is we're reading uh, books, reading letters that were written to other people, that have applications to us today. Um, it's got, otherwise, we're, we're saying all this was written in 2023 for me. See how self-centered that is? <laughs> and, and, but, but instead, what we see scripture is, is all these books, 66, you know, minus whatever, because some of them were one, so about 62 or 60, 60 books, so we've now divided into 66 written over 1,500 years. Moses starts in about 1450, uh, writing Genesis, and then uh, Revelation's about AD 95, so we've got about 1,500 years. All these different authors, and what, what brings about the writing of a book is God's people at that time need to know something. And so God inscripturates a book, sends a prophet, inscripturates a book um, to motivate them to repentance and faith. Um, a lot of times, it's, they, they need repentance. Sometimes, it's just they, they need direction. How do we act here? And they're, they're being fairly faithful, but they're confused. How do we apply love God and love neighbor in our circumstances? How can I be faithful to God in these circumstances? And so God writes them, writes them a book that we have um, now as part, of, as part of the Bible. Okay. Um, so um, that's uh, background for what we're going to look at here in, in Revelation 20. And 
we are uh, talking about Old Testament prophets because um, that's um, uh, Revelation is a book of New Testament prophecy. Uh, if you read Revelation and then read Ezekiel, you say, wow, these books are written by the same guy. You know, or it's the same style. Or if you read, you know, Isaiah or Micah or Joel, you know, th- it sounds like Revelation. You know, it's, it's, it's a kind of book that it's not a narrative telling history. Uh, it's not an epistle like Paul's writings, giving us kind of doctrinal facts and some to-dos there. Um, prophecy is, is very different, and Revelation is just a New Testament uh, prophetic book. And so this kind of thing is uh, important for us to, to see that this talks about, and let me write it up there because there's an important thing that, that you guys remembered well. Um, it's talking about potential uh, future. Um, and there, as you look in uh, Old Testament prophecy and in um, as you look in Old Testament prophecy, there are varying degrees of uh, how probable this is going to be. Um, in Old Testament prophecy, sometimes God takes an oath. He says, I swear by my name. He swears by his own name. And when that happens, it's like, oh, uh, this is going to happen. <laughs> right? Or he's been uh, prophesying um, uh, um, exile, which he foretold in Moses in Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. He's been prophesying exile to the people, but when Manasseh uh, puts up a, a graven image in the temple and starts pagan worship inside the temple, uh, God says, okay, exile's happening. It's no longer a potential thing. It's just a question, but even then, it's a question of when. A question of when. And so it doesn't happen during Manasseh's day. It happens um, 50 or so years later. Yeah, Jim. By the definition of Prophecy as the New Testament. Yeah. Revelation is not a prophecy. Because Revelation is an account of what will happen. No. <laughs> okay, that's why I asked the Okay, good. So <laughs> prophecy okay. is potential future. Okay? And so um when when we're when we're looking at it, and, and the potential can be in various ways. Um sometimes the thing um given as a potential future never happens. Why would that be? Because repentance and faith has happened. Jonah, does that ever happen? Were they destroyed in 40 days? Anytime during that 24 hour period, 40 days later, did that happen? No. No. Why didn't it happen? Yeah, because the prophecy worked. It motivated them to repentance and faith, which is what God wanted to do. God, God doesn't give prophecy because he, of, of bad things that are going to happen because he wants to do that. Uh, he says in Ezekiel in several places, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies. Speaking of Israel dying because of foreign armies coming in. So he says, I have no pleasure bringing in Assyria here, or, or uh, that's Ezekiel, so Babylon here to destroy you. So, and then the next line is, so repent and live. So I've warned you of this, I've warned you of this potential future, but I'm not delight, I won't delight to bring this about. So repent and and live and just stay in the promised land. Yeah, man. Not just to know what my thinking there, but there is, but I think where it was going with that is there is nothing that can be done to prevent Jesus from coming a second time. Correct, yeah. So in that sense, yeah. it's different from yeah. the that's right. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so that, and so there, there are things that are, um, like with Manasseh, okay, so Manasseh is a, a wicked king in Judah, um, uh, he, he reigns from, uh, he finishes his reign at, at 742, or no, sorry, 642, starts at 686, he's, he's Hezekiah's son, Hezekiah's been a faithful king. Uh, Manasseh is very unfaithful. And during his reign, which is a pretty long reign, it's kind of like 55 years altogether, he had some co-reigning with, with Hezekiah. 
but God declares, okay, exile will happen. But but Manasseh dies in in 642, um, but but exile doesn't happen until really six or five ninety seven. Um, and, and so the the certainty of the event is there, but even then the timing of the event is based on God's justice and what's exactly right. Um, and, and so there's, after Manasseh, he has a wicked son, Ammon, who re- reigns for two years, uh, but then Josiah is Manasseh's grandson, and Josiah, 12 years into his reign, turns to the Lord and, and starts reforming Israel and telling Israel to turn to the Lord. And then 18 years later, he restores the temple and, and things are very faithful then in the, the six teens um, there. Um, and, and so Josiah pushes back the exile from happening. Hezekiah, at about 700, had been told exile was going to happen to him. But he repents and turns to the Lord, and it gets pushed back about a thousand years. Again, because this is not a certain future, it's a potential future. And even when the events are certain, like Jesus will come back, or when God finally says, okay, exile is going to happen, even then, it's a, it's a question of what we don't know when. And so, be faithful. That's all we... We can't control the, the, the times of the events, but we can be faithful to the Lord. Um, and so that's what we're called to do. Does that sound like anything Jesus says? Yeah. What's Jesus say that's like this? The thief. Yeah, the thief. And what's the thief talking about? What event is that talking about? What does Jesus say is a, like a thief in the night? Second coming. Second coming. Yeah. Uh, my my coming will be like a thief in the night, and nobody knows when a thief is coming. Otherwise, they would have locked their house and you know got out their club, you know, to knock them on the head when they come in. You don't know; it's a surprise. No one will know. It'll be like the days of Noah, right? No one knows until it starts raining. And so, and so, what's what's he say? What's his kind of catchphrase there? Because the second coming is like a thief in the night. No one will know. There will be no signs. Be yeah, be ready. Be ready. Watch. Keep watch. Be ready. So be faithful and don't be like the the wicked steward whose master goes away and says, my master is going to be a long time coming. This is all Matthew 25 stuff. My master is going to be a long time coming. He starts beating the servants. And then the master comes back and finds him beating the servants. And Jesus says, don't have it be when I come back. That when you get surprised, <laughs> you're surprised doing while you're doing my will. That's what he says there. Okay, so, so the potential part for us is not that Jesus will come back. The potential is when. Uh, it, it, it could be, you know, Peter says in 2 Peter 3, be faithful and speed his coming. Okay, speed his coming. That's a command. Speed his coming. Uh, now, if you have sped, if all said and done, and you've sped his coming, when does that mean you were living? During the thousand years. End times. <clears throat> this is, this is, right. If you have, if you've acted in such a way that sped his coming, Are you been faithful? When, when were you living? Before the second coming? Yeah. What needs to happen before Jesus comes? Everybody needs to be saved. Everybody, he, yeah. Everybody needs, that's what Jesus says when, when, when the dead souls around his throne in Revelation 6 are saying, how long till you avenge our blood? We've been killed for our faith. How long? And what's his answer? Yeah, be patient until I brought in all your brothers. And so if you've sped Jesus coming, when's that mean you lived? When the last person came in. So how might you speed his coming? Sharing the gospel. Okay. 
Uh, so live your life in a way that, that honors the Lord, that the Lord can use to draw people to himself. Speak of him. Who knows? Maybe we're living at the very, maybe the last person ever to be saved has already been born. Maybe he's your neighbor. So if you share the gospel with him today instead of five years from now, yeah, you've sped Jesus coming. He can come as soon as all the brothers, he's brought all his bro you know, all your brothers in. Does that make sense? There. But you see that potentiality even with Peter in 2 Peter 3. He says, so what kind of lives ought you to live? Godly and holy lives and speed is coming. That's what he says there. Uh, and so that's how we, we don't just throw that verse under the rug. We say, what does he mean here? And it's understanding the, the um, coming of Jesus. Um, we don't know when it is, uh, but Jesus, we do know Jesus will save all that the Father has given him. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you still have a finger in John 6, you can look at John 6, 37 and 39. All that the Father has given him um, need to come in. Um, and so we can, uh, speed is coming uh, by sharing the gospel. Okay, um, so Revelation 20, um, uh, we're looking at, um, so the uh, thousand years, um, when is that? Now. Yeah, between now, so between Jesus' ascension and his coming again, um, and then uh, during that time, the first resurrection is happening, and what's the first resurrection? Again, this is verse 6. What's the first resurrection? Yeah, good. When believers die, their souls rise up to be with Jesus. That's the first resurrection. And so that's verse six. Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. John has just seen, again, a vision with dead souls around the throne of Jesus. And they're sitting with him, ruling and reigning, whatever that exactly means. We don't know exactly what that means. Uh, but it's good. Um, <laughs> uh, but he says, blessed are those who have taken part in the first resurrection. But the second resurrection hasn't happened yet. What's the second resurrection? Bodily, Bodily resurrection um, that we'll see in, in 20, um, uh, tw 2012. The dead, great and small, standing before the throne. All have been raised. Um, and, and so uh, then verse 7 uh, puts this new new little uh, uh, thing here comes as John is communicating with us and he says okay new time frame now and what's the new time frame in verse 7 thousand yeah the thousand years are over so Jesus coming back okay uh, so during the thousand years which didn't occur in 1030 all right that have been literal thousand years um, but but uh, this long period of time, a um, uh, thousand years are over. Um, Satan is released from his prison. What are some synonyms for the prison Satan is in now? Hell, Hell Hades. Hades, the abyss. Great, you got them all. Um, released from his prison, go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, uh, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Uh, in number, they're like sand on the seashore. Um, so uh, John has talked about this in some different visions before, uh, back in uh, 18 and 17 there, and he revisits this. Um, and so the question, uh, well, let's uh, go ahead. Who can read verse 9 for us? I read 8 for us. Who can read 9? Yeah, Laura. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. The fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Okay, and verse 10, who can read that? Yeah, Matthew. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they were, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Okay, um, so this would be, you know, anti-annihilationism. Um, so, you know, annihilationism, who knows what that is? Where you just cease to exist. Yeah, it's a ceasing of existing. It's just like you're punished and, and you cease to exist. That's annihilationism. 
<laughs> and then Matthew knew the answer, and he was he was mad that Allison just got it in front of him. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so you know, I I have, I have a friend, Dale Bittner, um, who became an, an, an annihilationist. You know, and I said, Dale, uh, you know, and he's, he was a pastor who went from being Baptist to PCA to some kind of Lutheran to some kind of more liberal Lutheran to some kind of really Lutheran something now, and now he's doing coffee shop singing in colleges. And, and so, uh, you know, it's a real shame. Dale's a great, great friend of ours. He was here at, at our mother church when we were first here, but he became an annihilationist. And I said, you know, Dale, you know, you're joining a, a list of heretics. You're joining, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses. You're joining others that believe in, you know, just a ceasing of existing. Uh, and so I started in my Bible just, you know, as I went through my Bible, just writing these anti-annihilation verses in there. But th this, you see, this is one of them in, in verse 10 here. Um, another one is at the end of Matthew 25, when Jesus separates the sheep and the goats. He, he talks about, you know, eternal punishment. The goats will go off to eternal punishment. Uh, but here you see a torment day and night forever and ever. Um, Jesus also refers to this as a weep, place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, so the devil and, and um, uh, the sea beast, the land beast, uh, false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. Um, down in verse 15, who else is, is thrown into the lake of fire? Verse 15. Yeah, so uh, verse, uh, verse 13, uh, we've got... Uh, or sorry, 14 is death in Hades, uh, and then 15, non-believers. Non yeah, so after final judgment, the, the sentence is pronounced, and uh, those whose names are not written on the book of life you know, are thrown into the, the lake of fire, uh, where Satan, sea beast, land beast are. Um, so um, now what has Satan done? Okay, now, so that's, that's Satan's end, but backing up to verse 7 here, what has Satan done when he gets released from, you know, he's been in the abyss or, or, or hell or his, his prison. Uh, uh, Peter calls it tar Tartarus. Um, there, um, uh, what does Satan do when he's released at the end of this era? After all have been brought into faith that Jesus is going to save, everyone who's going to be saved is saved. Satan's released from his prison. What does he do? Goes out and deceives the nations. And what does he do? What's his deception? He's deceiving them in a particular way that's written here. For yeah, for battle. He gathers, what, what's it say there? He gathers, yeah, he gathers them for battle. Who, who does he gather for battle? The nations from the four corners of the earth. So all the unbelievers around the earth, all gathered up. Uh, to fight, to fight against Jesus, uh, against his people. Now, uh, something to understand what's going on here, like in the next next verse here, is, you know, Philippians 3.20, anyone know what that says there about our citizenship as Christians? Yeah, our citizenship is in heaven. Um, who's in heaven? Jesus. Jesus. And what's what's his position over us? king yeah he's on the throne as king and so see all that how all that works together jesus is our king he is enthroned sat down at the right hand of god hebrews 1 3 um uh, hebrews or uh, ephesians 1 21 through 23 there talk about jesus sitting down and he's over all powers and authorities that kind of thing and um uh, uh hebrews 12 calls where jesus is sitting in his throne room a certain city. And what city is that? Yeah, the heavenly Jerusalem. Very good. And, and it's if you look, if, you're, if your page is open to it, you can see verse uh, 21, verse 2. Um, after final judgment happens, verse 21, 1, what does John see first? New heavens. new heavens and new earth. And then what does he see descending? The holy city. The holy city. Keep the new Jerusalem. And so the heavenly Jerusalem comes down to the earth. And then verse 3, who comes with the heavenly Jerusalem? 
Jesus to dwell with us. Um, we will be his people and God himself will be with us and be our God. Okay, that's verse 21, 3 there. Okay, so our citizenship now as Christians is in heaven and it's to our, we're loyal to our capital city, which is what? You just named it our heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, there. And, and so we are, one way we can speak of ourselves is that we're citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem. Right? Scripture says all those things. We're citizens of heaven. Uh, the heavenly Jerusalem is where Jesus is. Um, Hebrews 12 says we are those who are part of the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay? Um, and so as we look here at um, uh, verse 9, um, what's it say Satan, who's gathered all the nations, all the unbelieving people, uh, what are they gathered against? What do they do? Where, what's the geography and the people that are spoken of there in verse 9? Yeah, they're surrounding God's people. And where are they? The beloved city. The beloved city. Okay. Um, so now this, this is after... Um, this is after the um, thousand years. So verse 7, the thousand years are over. But it's... it's before the final judgment, right? Because Satan is not yet in the lake of fire. The people who have followed Satan are not yet in the lake of fire. So this is going on, this is going on before that. So what city is this talking about? Where God's people are? The church and people in the church are citizens of? The heavenly Jerusalem. Yeah, so all those things. So, so Satan gathers, gathers all unbelievers against the church. Is the city God loves. Those who are citizens of, of Jerusalem. Uh, um, is it possible that we're all, all gathered into one place geographically? Yeah, that's possible. It's not necessary, though, according to what Scripture says. Scripture says that all people who are believers in Jesus now are citizens of the heavenly Jerusalem. And we're scattered all over the earth, right? So it could be, you know, kind of like an, uh, an episode two kind of thing. Star Wars fans, what happens at the end of episode two? Where's Matt Workman when you need him? <laughs> the very end of episode two. What, 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 what's, the, what's the thing that happens that brings about the, the whole last 15 to 10 minutes of the movie? Oh, the, the Warriors don't play else. No, that's episode three. <laughs> Get your Star Wars right, man. They really watch for AD Space Opera. So, <laughs> the, the Clone Troopers arrived. Clone Wars. No. Uh, Yoda and the Jedi. Yes, what starts happening to Yoda and the Jedi? They get the first or something? They have the Clone Troopers now and they start winning. Okay. <laughs> Uh, or maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm talking about the, the end of. Uh, so you're right. You're right that you're wrong. <laughs> that's right. The clone troopers turn on that. I'm sorry. Yes. Where, where's the turn happened? Because that's what I'm talking episode about. Episode three, order sixty-six. <laughs> okay. Episode three, order sixty-six. Which here's what happens. All these all these people who are um, just out and amongst the Jedi and everyone else are unbeknownst to everyone they are going to turn against the Jedi and start killing them. And, and so that's, and they're just interspersed everywhere. It's not an army that's formed that comes against they're the Jedi all army. These different planets. They're in all these different planets and that kind of thing. And so you see three Jedi walking together and one of them gets, a, there's a flip switched and all the evil Jedi just slay the real Jedi who are, who are around them. Sorry if I spoiled that for you, episode three. There's right? no evil Jedi. It's the clone troopers that turn on the Jedi. Okay, so, so the that. I don't see it coming, so okay. they can't react. Yes, and so that could very much be... <laughs> Matt, boy, Matt would have gotten us straight on all this stuff. Sorry. So it, this could be... We, we just don't know. It's not, it's not clear enough. They, they come against um, the camp of God's people, the city, the city he loves. Okay. So they come against us. 
probably were dispersed around the whole world and that we haven't taken airplanes to some, you know, there's no, there's no physical city that God loves on the earth. The city he loves is, is the heavenly Jerusalem. And so, and we're citizens of that. And Satan gathers all in one final battle to extinguish us. Just like, who did Satan try to extinguish in verse, in, in chapter 12? Jesus. Jesus. So just as Satan had come against Jesus through Herod the Great, and then through Herod Antipas and Pilate, but Jesus was snatched up to safety. Um, so Satan brings all, you know, doesn't just use you know, the, the Herods and Pilate, but he now brings all people to do full bore what they're doing now, persecuting the church. Um, you don't believe that, do you? Right? That's what non-Christians say to us. You don't believe that, do you? Right? And so that's, that's not full bore persecution of you. But you're made to feel uncomfortable. And if you believe something the Bible says is true about the way a human being should live, and you communicate that today, they say, you bigot. Right? So there's persecution for us. But this is a full-scale, come-after-our-lives kind of persecution. So it's a transitioning from Jesus being persecuted by the Pharisees just in conversation in public settings to the Pharisees coming at night, capturing him, bringing him to Pilate, and encouraging the people to yell, crucify him, so that Jesus is crucified. And so that's the, that's the parallel that, that we're seeing that will happen to the church who's on earth when the thousand years are over. That, that Satan will be released from his prison and he'll no longer uh, be um, uh, restrained in any way. Um, and he'll gather all the, the unbelievers together to come against God's people um, who first, first uh, uh, Thessalonians 4 and 5 will be gathered unto Jesus to, to go with him in battle against those who have been gathered by Satan here. Yeah, uh, Matthew, you've had your hand up. So I think it's common, at least in kind of the evangelical approach, to read this scripture and say it's going to be a terrible time for Christians. Yeah. Like it very, very well made. Yeah. But, you know, I find encouragement if we look in the Old Testament. When God opens the floodgates as to his military, clearing the battlefield, yeah. there's very few losses on the good side. Right. And, and, um, and I forget which one it is. It's like David. David wins all his battles. Right. Because he always right. trusts in the Lord, and so all the more so with Jesus. Right. Yeah. And I think there's, I can't, I mean, I'm terrible with verses, but there's one where the army of God sweeps through the entire encampment of the enemies. There's not one single loss on the, on the side. Right. Yeah. There's one like Hezekiah, the, the, the one with the. Yeah. So, so they come out with no losses. Right. Yeah. So, like, in the lead up may be pretty bad. Yeah. But when God says, all right, enough. Yeah. I mean, it's going to yeah. be bloodbath on the other side. So, yeah. I mean, you know, well, safety doesn't get a little bit. You know what I mean. Yeah. I don't take care of heads, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jim. When you think about the verse for the same application. While Jim's asking this, go to First Thessalonians 4. Go ahead, Jim. For the saints to have patience. Yeah. That's a message for us, too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But the world is not going to get that. Yeah. These things are all going to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. So in a sense, we have to have patience too. Yeah, that's it. And and so you hear what Jim said there. You know, the the key um, exhortation that gets repeated throughout the Book of Revelation is patiently endure. So God says to His people over and over in Revelation, patiently endure. That's that's the and that's. So this was being communicated to those who were losing their lives to uh, the, the Roman emperor, Domitian. Yeah, Domitian. Uh, uh, and literally being killed because they would not bow to Domitian and declare him divine. Um, and because they were Christians and weren't doing this, they were being killed. And so uh, the revelations written to tell them, patiently endure. Endure all the hardships that you're going under right now in the, you know, A.D., 90 to 95 uh, but it's a message for us too 
That's the message for us. Patiently endure as things are not as they will be. We've got cancer, disease, persecution, but patiently endure. Hold to your testimony of faith. This is how you overcome. That's what the book of Revelation says. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the word of our testimony. So patiently endure with this word of our testimony. Jesus is God. He is my king. And if you ask me to disobey him, I can't uh, at pain of death. Yeah, Jim. Yeah. Like yeah. The yeah. The, the sands. Yeah. Yeah. The sands. Yeah. 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 Great. Great point and uh, incredible to think about. Yeah. Um, so First Thessalonians uh, four thirteen, um, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant. Remember, Paul's writing in A.D. fifty, right here. 5051. It's, it's uh, probably his first book of scripture. Um, brothers, do not, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep. This is what uh, first century people called dying. Jesus says, Lazarus has fallen asleep. And they say, oh, if he's fallen asleep, then he'll get better. And Jesus says, no, when I said fallen asleep, I mean, he's dead. <laughs> he specifically says that. And so that's what Paul's talking about too, just to understand the language. For those who have died, have fallen asleep, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. That speaks well for those, your brothers who have died in the faith in AD 50, or who have been killed by uh, Nero or some you know, Roman governor. Um, uh, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep, died in him. According to the Lord's own word, Jesus' own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, so if we, you know, Paul was including himself in this because Jesus said, I'm not going to tell you when I'm coming back, just watch and wait and be faithful. So Paul's saying it's possible Jesus will come back during our day, A.D. 50. Uh, but we know it's true for us now. Uh, according to uh, that, it could be, it's a possibility. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Um, so this is talking about physical resurrection. Who's going to be physically resurrected and given their um, glorified body like Jesus, uh, Philippians 3.21, glorified body like Jesus um, first. He says, 16, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. Now, this is what we just read in Revelation. Satan's been released from his prison. The nations have been gathered up against God's people. So what happens? What's the other? What's the flip side of this coin? What is Jesus doing that we had read about in Revelation 19, but now we read about in 1 Thessalonians 4 here? What's Jesus doing on his side? When Satan gathers the nations to gather against the camp of God's people, the city that he loves, what's Jesus doing? Verse 16, Jesus comes down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who aren't alive when the Lord comes, who've been, who died already, their bodies rise. Where, where have their souls been during this time? In heaven. Yeah, their souls have already experienced the first resurrection. But when Jesus comes back with a loud command, the, the trumpet call, calling all his people together, the dead in Christ, that is, their bodies will be raised. Um, uh, the dead in Christ will rise, verse, verse 17. After that, we who are still alive, when Jesus comes back, like if he comes back this afternoon, us, um, will be caught up together with them, with those who died 200 years ago, as their bodies are raised and they're experiencing the second resurrection um, along with us. Um, after, uh, caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with our Lord forever. Encourage one another with these words. Um, so this is not the end of things. Final battle happens there. It's just not Paul's point to get into that right now. Uh, but but this is what's going on when uh, the, everyone's been gathered by Jesus. Then Satan's released from his prison. He gathers all the unbelievers on the earth, but there are still believers 
on the earth. And in, in some way, it, this massive um, battle, it, you know, Satan and, his, and those who haven't believed are gathered together against God's people, but then Jesus appears. And what happens when Jesus appears then? Yeah, the dead are raised. What about those who are alive and have faith in Christ? They're raised as well, and they're gathered with Jesus in the air, and then we're at final battle there, okay, which, which John had talked about in chapter 19. Okay? Yeah, Matthew, and then so, we'll, we'll close with this. So if I'm, correct me if I got the sequence out of it, I don't know how I did it. If I'm, so the dead are raised, those who are still alive are raised, and then final battle occurs? Yeah, that's right. It's conceivable that there are no Christians involved in final battle, at, you know, in a, in a very technical, physical sense, because if the battle is done on earth or whatever. It's, it's with the gathering. Okay, so as Satan gathers, Jesus appears and gathers his, and they've, they've lined up against each other. Yeah, yeah. and so that, that kind of leads to the idea that we're not talking about something that's centered on physical, you know, terra firma, so to speak. Right, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, good. Okay, now, next time, now you've got all the background from the context of this verses 7 through 10, or 11 there. Um, we'll talk about... Gog and Magog and what they had meant in Ezekiel's day. That's from Ezekiel 38. And that was for them, little teaser here, that was a potential future for them. Gog and Magog gathered up against them after the, after the restoration from exile. Uh, but we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, it's something that never happens. Gog and Magog never gathers and comes against Israel. It was a potential future that they had that uh, other things came uh, came along, and that was a, that was avoided, kind of. Okay, all right. Well, let's pray.